Let's pray together. Father, you've all told us to ask and keep on asking, to seek and keep on seeking, to knock and keep on knocking. And here we are again, Lord, asking and seeking and knocking. You know the needs we have down here on earth. You know it better than we do. You know the challenges we're facing, the, the discouragement we're facing, the, the oppression that so many of us are feeling. You know our needs, Father. And we come to you today asking and seeking and knocking for your help, for your intervention, that you would continue, Lord, the, the slowdown and the stoppage of this virus. We pray for those who've been affected. Uh, so many in our own community are just now, it seems, beginning to come down with it. We pray your healing touch. For those who've not yet been infected, we pray your protection over them. For those, Father, who have lost loved ones, who've lost jobs, small business owners who are on the verge of losing their business, for people, Lord, who are still having to work even though they're at risk themselves, we just lift one another up to you, Father, and pray your protection, pray your grace, pray your peace for us. And Lord, we think of those in hospitals and long-term care facilities who have not been able to see their family in weeks and those families, Lord, on the outside who can't get in. And we just pray your comfort, Lord, in a very special way to those families and to those patients and residents. And Lord, for those facilities in our area that have been hit hard, we ask you for your grace and your peace to be with them. Lord, for our leaders, that they would have wisdom to know what to do as the governors are starting to make decisions, that they would have your wisdom, Father, and that they would know the right thing to do. And then may our leaders have the ability and the wisdom to consistently communicate to us the facts that we need to know. And Lord, again, we pray for those who are struggling with fear and anxiety, maybe some who are battling addictions, and this has been a very difficult time for them. I again pray for your strength for them and that they would be able to find resources to help them through this time. Lord, as we've said over and over, we don't know how this is going to end. We don't know what it's going to look like uh, uh, another week from now, a month from now. But we do know that you're still going to be God and you are still going to be in control, just as you are in control today. So, Father, in the midst of all the stuff that's going on, help us to be able to somehow keep our focus on you because you promised to keep in perfect peace as we Fix our minds on you. So, Father, thank you as we've studied over the last couple of months that you are our good shepherd and you are leading us through this valley and you're going to take good care of us. And I thank you for it. Would you pray with me the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you will find a Bible, or if you've got your tablet or phone handy, if you'll open up your Bible app to Luke chapter 24. And we'll be there in a couple of minutes, Luke chapter 24. I'm recording this on April the 19th, 2020, the week after Easter. And again, with the great ministry that is the internet, you can be watching this 10 years from now. If the Lord tarries, maybe 20 years from now, depending on how long the archives stay up. But if you are not watching this relatively recently to April of 2020, then you're looking back on April 2020 and you are remembering COVID-19 and you're remembering that this is where everybody talked about social distancing. And as I've been meditating and praying about what to preach these Sundays following Easter, my mind kept coming back to the importance of hope. There's an old saying that says, while there's life, there's hope. But I heard somebody say, you can reverse that, and it's just as true, and I believe that. While there's hope, there's life. 
I work, some of you may know, uh, other than pastoring Open Door, I also work as a healthcare chaplain. And in the hospital where I work, our patients are typically with us about three weeks, about 25 days. And a lot of times they will know they when they come in, their doctor tells them you're going to be here for this many days of IV antibiotics. Well, as long as they know the end date, they can maintain their hope. But often what happens with massive infections is that they run the culture and then they decide, oh, we need more antibiotics. And they go back to the patient and say, we're sorry, we're going to have to extend this two more weeks. And their hope begins to be threatened. And then often the physician will come back in a couple of weeks later and say, I'm sorry, we've got to extend this another two weeks. And as I visit these people, as they get this message, I can literally see on their faces, their hope beginning to diminish. And it's easy to give up when you don't have hope. The human spirit is strong. We can handle just about anything if we know what the end point is. And one of the things that's making this COVID-19 time so difficult is the end point seems to be moving. Back on April 3rd, our Georgia governor said, we're going to have shelter in place until the 13th. And we said, we can do that. That's only 10 days. We can do that. And then it was like, oh, no, it's the end of April. And we thought, oh, that's a little bit longer. And then it was, oh, no, to the middle of May. And I think all of us are kind of anticipating that it may be longer than that. And as the end point keeps moving, our hope diminishes. And when you start to lose your hope, life gets very, very difficult. So what do you do when you're having trouble holding on to hope? Now, maybe you're listening to me right now and saying, man, I'm not having any problem holding on to my hope at all. Good for you. <laughs> but there's probably going to come a day, a time in your life, a season of your life, when you're going to have a struggle holding on to hope. What do you do then? And even more seriously than that, what do you do when you've lost your hope altogether? The Bible helps us with this. In fact, there's an event, the first Easter Sunday, that gives us a living illustration of people who had lost their hope and how Jesus helped them. So our scripture lesson is in Luke 24. And this is an event that happens the evening of the first Easter Sunday. So remember what day it is. It's the first Easter Sunday. And in verse 13 of Luke 24, we have the beginning of this reading. And again, uh, if you've not yet found your Bible or your Bible app, please push pause on the video and go find it. I think it will be helpful to you uh, if you follow along. Are you back? Do you have Luke 24? All right. Verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Now again, remember, they've just lived through Holy Week. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? 
And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Fascinating story and teaches us an important truth on what to do when you lose hope. There are two travelers here. We know that one of them's name was Cleopas. We don't know the other traveler. And it's interesting as you read through um, Bible studies and commentaries and sermons, there's all kinds of theories about who the second traveler was. But I liked what one commentator said. He said, the learned cannot come to any agreement who the other disciple was, and I will give you this counsel. Let each of you take his place. <laughs> That's good counsel. These two were not a part of the 12. They were not as important as far as people knowing about them as the other disciples were. One of them totally unnamed totally anonymous. As I was thinking about that, I, I thought, you know, I think a lot of times we feel that way. We feel like we're the anonymous follower. We, we feel like nobody really knows our name. And if you feel that way, that nobody knows your name, that nobody really cares about you, that God himself even isn't, isn't even sure who you are, please let me remind you, this unnamed disciple is one of the heroes of one of the critical stories of the first Easter Sunday. God knows your name and he cares about you no matter what anybody says. So here are these two disciples. They're trudging home. It's between six and a half and seven, seven and a half miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they're on their way back home. They're trudging. <laughs> they're walking slowly. They're sharing their pain. They're sharing their confusion. They had hoped that Jesus was going to be the Messiah. They had hoped he was going to be the one that would free them from Roman tyranny. Now he's dead. And they're hurting. And they've lost their hope. You know what that walk is, don't you? That shuffle <laughs> when, when you've lost your hope and you're totally discouraged. Somehow discouragement stops you from being able to pick your feet up very high, doesn't it? And you just kind of shuffle along, and your shoulders are slooped, and your head is down, and you're just barely moving. That's what they're doing on their way to Emmaus. Jesus, all of a sudden, joins them. They don't know who he is. They don't recognize him. If somebody had asked them, Hey, is Jesus with you? They said, are you kidding? He's dead. Don't you remember? They killed him. We thought he was the Messiah, but now nothing makes sense. <coughs> and again, there will be times in our lives when we could say that. We thought we could trust him. We thought it was going to be okay. And now our hope is gone. You know what it's like to have been counting on someone or something, but now your hope is gone. That is an excruciatingly painful place to be. And I don't have to remind you of the times in your life when you have reached that point. I thought I knew something, and now it's all blown up in my face. It's really tough when it comes to your relationship with God. I thought 
that God is going to protect me from this, but now one of my loved one has the virus, or one of my loved ones has died from the virus. I thought, but it hasn't worked out the way I anticipated. So if you need the truth today, I'm glad you're tuning in. If you don't need it today, there's going to come a time in your life when you're going to need this truth. So let's look at this event from the very first Easter. Again, remember, it's the first Easter Sunday. And learn what to do when you lose hope. Now the travelers are walking along. There's two of them, Cleopas and the unnamed one. And they are traveling without hope. We had hoped, they say in verse 21, that he was going to be the Messiah. Those are some heartbreaking words. We had hoped. They were convinced he was going to be the Messiah. Now he's dead. Their hope is shattered. And as a result of that, their joy is gone. It's hard to maintain joy when you don't have any hope. And it says they were walking along and Jesus says, what are you talking about? And it says, they stood still, their faces downcast. One translation says, they stood still looking sad. When your hope is gone, your joy is gone. But what's interesting is, their desire was not gone. The, the phrases that are used here, that they were talking together, that they were discussing together, are very intense words. It's kind of like their body language is, we've given up. But as they're talking back and forth, now we're not, we don't know what they were talking about. We can anticipate that since when Jesus says, what are you talking about? They say, haven't you heard what's been going on in Jerusalem? That they were talking about what had gone on in Jerusalem. They may have been rehearsing, if they had been there Palm Sunday, what that was like, the triumphant entry. And then all of the events of Holy Week. And then they got stuck at the crucifixion and their hopes are shattered. But the words indicate their discussion was intense. Their body language says we've lost our hope. But the intensity of their discussing back and forth indicated they still had something inside that still wanted to make sense out of it. And it hit me the last couple of days as I've been working on this. If you're still questioning, if you're still fighting with God, if you're still arguing with God, I think that's a good sign. What's really tragic is when you just absolutely give up. But if there is something within you, even if you're going through, whenever you're watching this, even if you're going through the pits of your life, if you still have enough gumption, that old word, to where you're saying, God, where are you? And why aren't you doing something about this? Good. You've not given up altogether. And these disciples, as hopeless as they were, haven't given up altogether. They are still trying to figure out what in the world was going on. What got them to that state? What's interesting is in verse 16, it says that when Jesus came and joined them, they were kept from recognizing him. Now, I don't think that Christ, you know, did some hocus pocus and caused them to not know who he was. I think it was their own emotional and spiritual struggle that blinded them to who he was. You may have had that experience where your own emotional and spiritual sense of hopelessness blinded you to any good thing that was happening in your life. And all you could see was the negative. I think that was what was going on. They were too upset to think straight. They had slid that slippery slope from disappointment to distress to despair to depression and everything was bad news. And they were so upset, they couldn't think straight. See, that's one of the difficulties of trying to overcome depression. When you're depressed, everything is bad news. And it can be hard to dig yourself out of that and, and somehow force yourself to look at the positives that are going on. And that's why it's so important that we build into our lives 
the character trait of doing what's right, whether we feel like doing it or not. And it's another reason why, especially if you're watching this in the spring of 2020, that we don't immerse ourselves in all the bad news. Yes, we need facts about how we should live and how we should conduct ourselves, but we don't need to wallow in the what ifs. Now, if it's your job to game plan all kinds of scenarios, that's one thing. You know, if you're responsible for a business or something and, and you're responsible to say, well, if this happens, what are we going to do? And if this happens, what are we going to do? And to plan ahead for that, that's one thing. I'm not talking about that. But for me, no one has yet called me and said, Ken, what is your idea about what we should do to reopen the state? Nobody's asked me that. So why am I angsting about it? Because it's out of my control, except I can pray. So what I want to say to you is, as kindly as I know how, if what you're exposing yourself to in the media and the social media is robbing your peace and attacking your hope, be careful. Don't immerse yourself in that because it's a downward spiral that you will find almost impossible to get out of. And, and that's the struggle that they're saying in verses 22 through 24. We trusted him. We followed him. He's dead. And what is more, this is the third day. So again, remember, Jesus had told them before his death, I will be resurrected on the third day. They understood that. They're quoting it to themselves. He said he was going to be raised on the third day, and it's the third day. And we haven't seen him yet. But then did you read what they said? Some of our women went to the tomb, it was empty. They said they saw angels who told them he was risen. Then some of our companions, our fellow disciples, went to the tomb. They found it empty. Now, when you're on the top of your game, when you're alert and oriented and your faith is strong and your hope is strong, if you'd have heard that, the women went to the tomb, it's empty. They saw angels who told them he was risen. We had some other people go, look, the tomb is empty. You'd have said, he's alive. He told us he would be raised from the dead. The tomb is empty. He's alive. Wonder when he's going to show up and talk to us. But when you're too upset to think straight, the key verse there, him, they did not see. So see, even while they're rehearsing what should have been Positive news. The women saw the tomb empty. The angel said he's risen. Our disciples saw the tomb empty. That should have said to them, he's alive. What it said to them was, but nobody's seen him yet. That's the struggle of losing your hope. Even the positives turn into negatives. And by the way, it's still Sunday. It's still the third day. So why are you going back home? He said he would be raised on the third day. You know he said he'd be raised on the third day. It's still the third day, and you've already left Jerusalem, and you're already going home. Couldn't you have talked to the people at the front desk where you were staying and said, I need to stay the night because I'm going to give him the full third day before I give up? But again, when you lose your hope, it causes you to quit too soon. And here are these disciples, not even giving Jesus the full third day. Again, that's the difference between when you're on top of things mentally and emotionally and spiritually, and you say, yeah, it's getting late afternoon, but it's still the third day. And I'm still going to give him till whenever the day ends to show up. But when you've lost your hope, by about noon, you say, well, you know, it's noon. I wonder if he's going to come. And then by the middle of the afternoon, you've just given up and said, well, you know, it's the third day. And if he was going to show up, he'd have showed up by now. Let's go back home. It's devastating when you lose your hope. You give up too soon. You quit too soon. You give up on God too soon. Just keep hanging in there. The third day is not over yet. So they were too upset to think straight 
And even the things that should have been positives, they turned into a negative. Nobody's seen him yet. But Jesus says to them in verse 25, that you are foolish and slow of heart. They were too ignorant of the scriptures. The word foolish means slow to understand. The word slow of heart means slow to respond. He says, you are too slow of heart to believe what the prophets had spoken. Sometimes we end up on our own road to Emmaus because we're too slow to respond to what the Bible says. He says, remember what the prophet said. Remember the prophecies of the resurrection. And, and sometimes when our hope starts to be attacked, we tend to pull back from the scriptures and then we don't understand it as clearly and we're not able to make scriptural sense out of what's happening to us. I don't think Jesus was chastising them. I think he was just describing them. He said, the reason you're in the situation you're in is because you're slow to understand and slow to respond what the scriptures have said. And he said, so let me help you. <laughs> and he gives them this incredible Bible lesson, beginning with Moses and the prophets, about himself all through the scriptures. Man, as a Bible teacher, I would love to have had those notes of Christ in all the scriptures, beginning with Moses and the prophets. So what do you do when you lose hope? Look at what Jesus did. The first thing he told them was, you need to remember and understand that God makes no mistakes. It says he told them that Christ had to suffer these things and then enter his glory. He shows them that it was necessary for Christ to die. They probably never grasped the fact that Jesus had to die. And when they understand that, then they realize that the crucifixion was not an accident. It was part of God's plan. And, and we need to understand that no matter what we're going through that has our hope shaken, I'm not telling you God caused it, but I am saying that we need to remember that God will work through everything for the good of those who love him. Again, that's the promise of Romans 8, 28. And I know you didn't realize it was in the Bible so many times, but that's the promise of Romans 8, 28. God is working in all things for the good of those who love him and are in harmony with his plan. We used to sing a song here at Open Door. I put my faith in you. You're the one who will never leave me. I put my faith in you no matter where the road may lead me. God never says, oops. God is never taken by surprise. He is still working on your behalf no matter what's going on in your life, whether it's April 2020, whether it's November 2022. God is at work in your life. He never quits working on your behalf. Now, I am very aware of the fact that if you're watching this and you're not a follower of Christ, I sound like I've lost my mind. And, and you're saying, but you, you're telling me that no matter what's going on in my life, God is working in it. If you love him and if you're in harmony with his plan for you, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And that takes faith. And that's hard. You know, when, when, when you don't know God on a personal level and you hear some preacher say, trust God, he's at work no matter what, we sound like we've lost our minds because you don't see any evidence of it. But that's what faith is. And the Christian life, the life of following Christ, is the life of faith. And that is almost impossible to understand if you've not entered that life of faith. So for those of you who are believers and you're having a struggle trying to talk to people nowadays about faith in the midst of crisis, understand that, that it's hard for somebody who doesn't know God to understand what we're even talking about when we talk about trusting that God makes no mistakes. But if you're going to get your hope back, you've got to get back to that understanding. 
God makes no mistakes. And even though I don't believe he sent this virus, and I don't believe he sent whatever's going on in your life that has you upset today, he will work through it for your good if you will stay committed to him. The second thing he does is he says, let me show you from the scriptures everything that you need to understand. When you start to lose your hope, run to the Bible. It's so important because the, the thing that helps a heart that's lost hope is to see that God's word deals with your situation and deals with it in such a way as to show you God is still with you. You, you read the stories of people in the Bible who've gone through incredibly more challenging times than we ever are. God is always with them. And, and as you realize that, it starts to build your hope. As you read the Psalms, we just spent two months going through the 23rd Psalm to remind us that God is with us, even through the valley of the shadow of death. God's word will speak to your situation. It may not be the definite question, answer to a specific question, but the Bible will guide you in the right direction and it will build your faith as you wait for the answer. So they're traveling on the road and Jesus is giving this incredible Bible story saying, you need to understand what the Bible says so you'll understand what's going on. And then they get to their destination. And Jesus acts like he's going to keep on going. But it says they urged him strongly to stay with them. That, that's a, a phrase that means they, they pressed him beyond his ability to resist. They were serious about Christ. They still weren't sure who he was, but they knew he was speaking words they needed to hear. And so intensely they say, you got to come in and hang out with us a little bit longer. Maybe you've had a good friend and you've been in a discussion, and it was time to go. Neither of you wanted to go. He said, we're just going to stay here a little bit longer and get another Diet Coke or another cup of coffee because we've got some more talking to do. And that's what they were doing. They, they got serious about Christ. I personally believe that if they had not urged him to stay, he would have kept going. I believe there are a lot of people to whom Christ has drawn near but with whom he has not stayed because they haven't invited him to stay. I want to encourage you that if you've lost your hope or you're losing your hope, get back to getting serious about God. Say, God, I need you. I can't do this by myself. I'm struggling and I need you. Don't forsake me now. Fanny Crosby's old song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. We've got to say to him, God, I need you now more than I ever have. Stay with me, please. And so he goes in. And he reveals himself in the breaking of bread. An everyday occurrence. It wasn't a big feast. They were just having their normal evening meal, breaking bread. And we don't know how he was revealed. I personally think that it was probably as he took the bread and broke it and gave it to them and his hands were extended, they saw the nail prints in his hands. And suddenly they know who he is. And suddenly they realize while we've given up our hope, hope has been right here with us the whole time. But it happened not with a lightning bolt, not with handwriting in the sky. It happened in the very commonplace, everyday occurrence of the breaking of bread. And I want to say to you that when you start to lose your hope and you ask God, God, you got to show yourself to me. I need you to reveal to me that you're still with me. Don't look for the big spectacular things because typically he reveals himself in the everyday things. Pay attention to a sunset. Pay attention to a call from a friend. Pay attention to the words of a song of praise or a scripture verse that comes to your mind. It was kind of interesting, um, after all of the storms of last weekend, Easter Sunday, 
uh, over New York City after the storm had passed by. There was a gorgeous rainbow over the city. And it was amazing how many non-Christians posted that picture and said, what a picture of hope for us. Those of you who know the biblical symbolism of a rainbow know, yes, indeed, that's a picture of hope. It's the promise of God that he's not going to destroy the world by water again. So what I'm saying is, look for God in the ordinary, everyday occurrences. But he's revealed them himself to them. Their healing is complete. He's gone immediately, disappears, but that doesn't matter because they have now seen him and they understood and they say to each other, that's why our hearts were burning within us while he talked to us as we're walking along. It's Jesus. He's here. He's alive. And all of a sudden, their energy is back. Their hope is back. And they turn around and go back the seven miles back to Jerusalem and go to where the other disciples were. And as they come into the room, the other disciples said, hey, Jesus is alive and he's appeared to Peter. And they said, oh, you just need to hush because you need to hear what we saw and let us tell you what happened to us. And they talk about how he was revealed to them in the breaking of bread. Such an important lesson for us today. When you lose your hope, pour out your heart to him. I love the fact that as Jesus joins these disciples, he asks them, what are you talking about? And I think that today he's asking you, why are you so sad? What are you worried about? What's got your hope down? Tell him. Sometimes it helps just to express what you're feeling to God. And then ask him to show himself to you through scripture, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Ask him to show himself to you through the ministry of other people, that there's some kind of a sign. I often pray for people that God will give them a specific indication that means something to them that shows God is still interested in their lives. I pray that for you, that maybe today in some ordinary thing, something will hit you and you'll say, that's God. That's God telling me. He still cares about me because the promise is when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they won't sweep over you. When you go through the fire, you won't be burned. It's even more difficult when we're not allowed to meet together face to face in the same building for church. It's even more difficult to hold on to your hope because sometimes we walk into the church building with our hope down but we leave with our hope built up. And so I want to encourage you, even though we're limited pretty much to online sermons and online church services, don't ignore those. Keep yourself going to church in whatever way you can. You may even want to explore some other sermons that are online, some other churches. You have a lot of opportunities as churches are streaming services at all hours anymore. Just, just find a way to keep your hope built by feeding yourself on the word of God. Draw close to him and say to him as these disciples did, don't leave us, we need you. And then watch him reveal himself to you. They had lost their hope, but capital H hope had been with them the whole time. And my prayer for you today is that you will realize in a very personal way that he is with you too. Now next week we're going to dig deeper into hope, what the Bible says about hope. We're going to talk about some ways to add to your hope, to understand hope, so that hopefully you won't feel like you have to give up on your hope. So um, hang in there one more week, and Lord willing, next week we'll talk some more about hope. Keep your eyes on Christ. Keep your focus on him and watch him build your hope. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. And may the God of hope fill you with joy as you keep your trust in him. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being with us.